going to be talking today about the problem of normativity. That is a fancy way of talking about the gap between is and ought, between descriptions of the world and prescriptions or evaluations of the world, directives about what to do. As you can see, I'm comparing it to the South Park underpant known episode. I like underpants, phase one, phase two, question mark, phase three, profits. Well, in our case, the problem is going to be phase one, collect facts. Then phase two, question mark, phase three, make moral judgments. <laughs> Tell people what they ought to be doing. Judge things as right or wrong, good or bad, just or unjust. And the question is how we get from facts to moral judgments, to evaluations. How they fit in general into a scientific picture of the world. Let's go back to the Enlightenment, the 17th and 18th centuries, in other words, and think about two fundamental ideas. These two ideas, it seems to me, define a lot of the problems of the modern age, and specifically set the stage for the difficulties faced by thinkers and writers in the 20th century. These two thoughts really shaped, in that sense, the 20th century. They shaped the centuries before, too, they're crucial for 17th, 18th, and 19th century history. They still remain open questions, but I think they're, they're important because, in a way, you can see a lot of what happens in the 20th century as a direct response to them. The first problem, the first theme, is the problem of normativity. That is to say, how do we get from is to ought? How do I simply describe the world and then conclude something about what ought to happen, what ought to be done, what's fair and unfair, what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, virtuous and vicious? It's not at all clear how I get from descriptions of the world to some kind of prescription about what ought to be done. This is often described as the gap between fact and value. There are facts, there are values then, ways in which we evaluate those facts and make judgments about them. How do we relate the facts to the judgments? It seems on the one hand as if there's an intimate relation, because it would be hard to imagine myself given the same set of facts and then reaching two radically different sets of moral judgments about the same facts. So in some ways, the facts seem to determine how they ought to be valued. And yet, on the other hand, it doesn't seem, logically speaking, if there's any way to get from the facts to the values. There's a logical gap, and it's unclear what we ought to do about that. Let's start with a basic distinction, the distinction itself between fact and value, between the descriptive and the normative. Some terms are descriptive. They tell us how the world is. Other terms are normative. They express norms. They express values in some way. And these things overlap to some extent. They are two separate things. Some terms both describe things and evaluate them. So, for example, some language is purely descriptive. It doesn't carry any value connotation at all. It's just describing the way things are. What are some adjectives that you might say are purely descriptive, that have nothing to do with evaluating anything? They just describe something. Blue, good, my shirt is blue. Does that involve an evaluation? No, it's just a description. Some other things that are like that. Measurements. Okay, good. We can say, I'm six feet tall. That doesn't by itself carry anything that's evaluated about. It's a mere description. There are things that are normative, though, that carry some sort of dimension of evaluation to them. So what are some examples of things like that that are evaluated? Good. Good, exactly, excellent. Good is a, it's a good example of something that is normative, right? When I say that's a good example, I'm evaluating it. I'm saying, well done, that is a good case of this. Now, is it something that's in the overlap, or is it purely normative? If I tell you something is good, I really haven't given you much of a description of it, right? I say, you say, oh, how was your day yesterday? And I say, good. Now, you so far don't really know anything of the description, right? You don't know what made it good. You don't know what happened to me or what I did yesterday. All you know is the evaluation. So that is sometimes called a thinly normative term. That is to say, it gives you the up or the down, but it doesn't tell you anything more. So it's really in this category of what I've called you the purely normative. Good, bad, right, wrong, tend to be like that. But there are some terms that describe things and evaluate them. If blue just describes but doesn't evaluate, and good evaluates but doesn't describe. Can you think of anything that is in the overlap that both evaluates and describes? Yeah? It's humid in Houston. It's humid in Houston. <laughs> does that evaluate? Well, actually, <laughs> yeah, does that evaluate anything? Maybe, 
right? Assuming that most people don't like humidity. Uh, so humid, I think the day is human. That is descriptive. But it may well carry an evaluative component because most people don't like humidity very much. And so, yeah, humid might be an example of something. I described the day as humid. It is descriptive. But you might think that carries some evaluative component along with it. Yes? Beautiful. Beautiful. Ah, OK, beautiful is in part descriptive, but it's in part evaluative. I'm evaluating something as good, but I'm describing the way in which it is good, right? Uh, that its appearance is good, let's say. Other things that might be in the thick category, things that are parsimonious. OK, good. <laughs> Parsimonious, is that a good thing or a bad thing? What does parsimonious mean? <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> Come on, you guys took the SAT. This is a classic <laughs> SAT word. Well, let's, let, let's generalize it, OK? Lots of terms about virtues and vices. Virtues of people and vices of people, but also of situations and so on are like this. So let's take a simple thing. I call somebody brave. That's a description of them, but it's also an evaluation, right? Brave makes you think thumbs up, not thumbs down. If I say cowardly, you think that's not only a description, but that's sort of a thumbs down. Yeah. Alcoholic, what about that? <laughs> Is that, does that have an evaluative component? It's certainly descriptive, but you might think, yeah, the background information we have is that being an alcoholic is not a good thing, right? And so you might think that is something that is part of the evaluative. In fact, here you might think, yeah, it's not just three categories. There's something like a line here. Some of these things are mostly descriptive that have a little evaluative component, like human. Others may be heavily evaluative, like cowardly. Um, other examples like this that are in that degree. Yeah. Say that again. Oh, okay, good. Feeling blue in the sense of being melancholy. Okay, that's something that might be evaluated. If I say, oh, yeah, blue, not in the sense of blue shirt, but blue in the sense of, yeah, yesterday I was feeling blue. Uh, <laughs> you think, really? I was feeling pain. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that, no, it's, it's not purely descriptive in that case. It is evaluated in part of saying, yeah, it wasn't a good day for me. So, uh, <laughs> iPad is bored and telling me who are. We get it. Okay. So, here's the question really how those things on the one side, the purely descriptive, relate to the more normative things? There are lots of terms that are purely or thinly normative good, bad, evil, right, wrong, should, ought, may, must, virtue, vice, obligation, permission. All of those things, talking about what you ought to do, what you may do, what you mustn't do. Those are things that have to do with evaluation. Those are normative terms. But then in that thick category are lots of things that do carry descriptive content, too. Things like courage, integrity, generous, honest, sincere, kind, prudent, foolish, rash, lazy. Some of those are sort of thumbs-up terms. Some are thumbs-down terms. And so the thick terms evaluate as well as describe. But here's the key thing. All of those normative terms compare the way the world is with the way it ought to be in some way. And so they aren't purely describing. Maybe they do some descriptive work. But in addition to that, they're comparing it and saying, oh, it's not what it ought to be. Or, oh, yes, it is what it ought to be. It's excellent. And so there is some degree of evaluation, too. It is not purely a matter of description. Now, that raises an interesting question. How do the descriptive terms and the normative terms relate? And we're going to be talking here a little bit about the ideas of David Hume. Hume wrote, when he was 23 years old, the treatise of human nature. As you can see, it's a thick book. Uh, that's my copy of it. It's well used, as you can see, falling apart. Hume's book initially was a great disappointment to him. He thought he was doing something revolutionary in philosophy, published this book, and he later wrote, it fell stillborn from the press. Nobody seemed to pay any attention to it, nobody read it. He wanted to get a university position at Edinburgh, but he failed because it was suspected on the basis of the book that he was an atheist. And so he ended up writing histories and writing other things, supporting himself as a writer. Uh, but this did later become recognized as one of the great works of Western philosophy. Now, he advances in book three a very distinctive view of ethics, one that has shaped ethical thinking ever since. It has largely well, I think you could say it has had a huge impact on 19th century thought as well as 20th century thought. 
Hume has not always been thought of as a hero. Sometimes he has been, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. And actually, many contemporary philosophers in Britain and the United States are still Humeans. But however you think of this, it's a problem. It's a way of viewing ethics that remains, if you like it or hate it, uh, a key thing that you have to respond to. Here's his idea. The basic argument is this. Morality seems to have an influence on actions and affections. That is to say, feelings. So if I say that was a cowardly action, you tend to think and feel a certain way about it, right? You tend to think, oh, that wasn't the right thing to do, and you tend to feel negatively in some way about it. And so my moral judgment affects the way you feel about things. It is also something that has something to do with action. If I tell you, look, you ought to do this, or you've got to do that, those are things that are going to affect your actions. But now Hume says, reason alone can have no such influence. If I am just within the realm of reason itself, what am I doing? Essentially, he says, I am calculating, I am describing, I'm talking about what is, but I can't draw any conclusions what I have about what I have to do, what I ought to do, what I may do, what's good and what's bad. And so reason, he says, has no influence by itself on actions and affections. So, he says, morality cannot be a conclusion of reason. Now, is he right about this? Well, it depends. <laughs> Does morality have an effect on actions and affections? You could deny it. You could say, well, maybe, but it's purely an accident. It's not essential that it does. There could be a society where people just ignored moral judgments. What about reason? Most people have objected to that second one. Is it true that reason has no effect on actions? Well, Hume says basically, and here he's going back all the way to Plato in a sense, Plato gives us a model of the soul where it consists of three parts. It consists of reason, emotion, and, in addition to that, uh, design. And he compares it to a chariot. He says reason is like the person driving the chariot, and then the two horses are like emotion and desire. Well, Plato says, Emotion and desire are crucial because reason by itself wouldn't go anywhere. Detach the horses from the cart, and the cart doesn't move. And so, really, reason by itself can't move anything. It's reason combined with desire, or reason combined with emotion, or feeling, that actually leads us to action. And Hume's agreeing. He's saying, well, reason by itself can't do anything. You might draw some conclusion, but it's another thing to get you to actually do something as a result of that. That requires desire, it requires feeling. And so it's not just a matter of reason. But he says, if that's right, then morality doesn't consist of any matter of fact. And here is the really famous passage where he talks about the gap between is and ought. Hume is Scottish, by the way, so I'll do my best. In every system of morality and matter, <laughs> I've noticed that the other proceeds for some time, reason in the ordinary way, to establish the existence of a God, or making points of human affairs, and then he suddenly surprises me by moving to pro from propositions with the usual copy of is or is not to ones that are connected by ought or ought not. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not finished. <laughs> this seems like a very small change, but it's highly important. For this ought or ought not expresses some new revelation or affirmation. It needs to be pointed out and explained, and a reason to be given for how this new relation can be inconceivably a deduction from others that are entirely different from. Now, by the way, when I did the movie, I found out that people in other parts of the world find my doing accents like this offensive. <laughs> they were, Europeans got upset about this. They thought I was somehow, in some way insulting the Scottish in <laughs> doing this. I, in case you have that, I mean, I hope you don't. Nobody in the U.S. has ever had that reaction, but. Um, let me assure you that I am not meaning to insult the Scots or anything else. In fact, I had a pastor when I was a young man who was from Scotland, and, and every sermon of Satro was like that. <laughs> okay, from here after here, and he gave long sermons. So I just got. Anyway, that is the fact that he's In any event, here's the idea. Moral reasoning, we can say, okay, goes from is to ought in some fashion. But Hume is saying, look, I don't see how it can do it. There is no logical connection between the is and the ought. I might describe a certain action as a murder, and I'm saying, it is a case of murder. And then I say, so it's terribly wrong. But what's the link between calling it murder and saying it's wrong? 
What is the connection? How do we go from murder to wrong? Well, something gets us there. He's not saying it's an incorrect inference, but it's not a matter of pure reason itself. Reason doesn't supply the connection. Something else must be doing. So what is it? Well, here's a way of thinking it in South Park terms. <laughs> Phase one is the description. Is. For example, it is a murder. Phase two, question mark. Phase three, okay, something that is a normative judgment, like that is wrong, or you should not have done that, or something like that. And the question is, what can be filled in by those question marks? What's phase two? What gets us from the is to the ought? Well, what are the possibilities? What are some options here? Well, one thing is to say nothing, okay? That it's just sheerly irrational to go from the ism to the ought. And so that could be one thing. Yeah, we conclude these things about what ought to be done, what may be done, but all that's crap, okay? <laughs> the only thing that makes any sense is the description of the world, and then we make these irrational conclusions about things. Fooey on it. Yeah? Um, like societal preservation? Ooh, it could be facts about societal preservation. So you might think here, there's a special class of facts. Like, for example, society is better off. If, or if maybe it's necessary to society survival that people do this or not do that. And so you might think it's something about social good or social survival that goes into phase two. Yeah? Oh, okay, a higher being. It could be some fact about God. Maybe it is this displeases God, or God commands that. And that's why human, particular, to mention God in this connection. Says some writers try to get from is to ought by the is's that have God in them. Okay, God is commanding this or has commanded that, and that is something that gets you from the is to the ought. Yeah. Emotion? Emotion. Yes, it could be, and in fact, this is Hume's answer, right? It's emotion. I have that description, and then I have some feelings about it. I have an emotional reaction to it. I have a feeling of approbation or disapprobation in my breast. <laughs> okay, as he puts it. And what that tells me is that it's right or that it's wrong. I see someone help an old lady across the street and I smile. And I think, good, because it arouses a feeling of approval in me. I see somebody come in a murder. Luckily, I've never witnessed a murder. My grandfather did. He was six years old when he saw a murder as he was walking to school. <laughs> so I said, Grandpa, what do you do? He said, I cut back out of there as fast as I could. <laughs> uh, but in any case, you might witness a murder and say, that's wrong. And then what happens? You feel a strong feeling of disapproval. Are there any other options for what might fill in the question marks? Yeah. Society. Society. Okay, we talked about social good, but it could also be a social judgment, right? It could be, remember I said it could be God's command. It could be just a social command. It could be, could be society approves of this or disapproves of this, right? There are rules against this. Uh, there are conventions against this. And so it could be something involving the good of society, but it could also just be what society disapproves. Well, Hume's answer, as I mentioned, is to talk about feeling. He says, why is cruelty wrong, for example? Why is generosity good? There is no fact of the matter to be found in them. If I just say that action was cruel or that action was generous, there is nothing by itself there that allows me to draw any normative conclusions by reason alone. Instead, I tell you, that was cruel. Right, how do you emotionally react to it? Yeah, you have a negative reaction, right? That feeling of disapprobation. <laughs> okay, and that is in part what is driving your conclusion that it's wrong. Uh, incidentally, <laughs> let me describe an instance of this sort of thing. Um, years ago, when Plan 2 was first founded, there was a philosophy course that every sophomore in Plan 2 has to take. Um, it's called Problems of Knowledge and Valuation. The person who created the course and taught it frequently in those early years was John Silver, who later became president of Boston University and ran for governor of Massachusetts. Uh, in any case, John Silver one time got two papers from students in that Plan 2 course that were identical. Okay, one had clearly copied from the other, or they had both copied from some, some third source, but in any case, they were exactly the same. So here's what he did. In front of the class, he said, um, you and you, I want you to stand up and read your papers for me. Read your first sentence. So that student reads the first sentence. You read your first sentence. Of course, it's exactly the same. He kept going, second sentence, second sentence. It took the entire hour and 15 minute class period doing this. 
okay, utterly humiliating to people. Um, they dropped out of Plan 2 that day. <laughs> but what's interesting is that like two dozen other people dropped out of Plan 2 that day. Why? Because they thought that was such horribly cruel punishment. Notice he didn't fail the students. He didn't actually enforce any academic punishment at all. He just humiliated them. And people found that humiliation so cruel that they did something about it. So notice what happened. They witnessed an event, right? Purely description. They have an emotional reaction to that, to the cruelty they see in it, and then they respond in certain ways. It's a case that actually fits Hume's analysis very, very well. So here's Hume's conclusion. It is the object of feeling, not of reason. It lies in yourself, not in the object. Now that's important, because if it's a matter of feeling, then the badness, the goodness, the justice or injustice, that's all in you. It is not in the action. It's coming from something in you. It is arising from feelings within you. And so the world doesn't contain justice and injustice, good and evil, right and wrong. You are interpreting it that way on the basis of your emotions. And so he says, an action or sentiment or character is virtuous or vicious. Why? Because of you causes the pleasure or uneasiness of a particular kind. Okay, and that's really all it comes down to, our own feelings about it. Okay, so there's his view. It's really sentiment. It's feeling. It is emotion that takes us from phase one to phase three, right? That go, takes us from is to on. So we go from the description by way of feelings. That arouses the feeling of approbation or disapprobation in me to then a conclusion about what ought to be done, what's good or bad, right or wrong, just or unjust. Now, I want you to think for a moment about this. There are some obvious questions I at least would like to ask you, but maybe you have these questions too. Are there any questions that occur to you thinking about that particular answer? Yeah? Well, I've noticed a theme, sort of. Is, well, isn't the whole point here that morality is what takes us from phase one to phase three? Everything that he said about morality, all of his examples, it's all well, is morality what takes us to, from phase one to phase three? The moral judgment outright is really just phase three, right? And so the question, in a sense, is how we get there. Now, I think you're noticing something very important. Whatever gets us from the purely descriptive to the normative must have some normative component to it. Otherwise, how on earth are we getting there, right? <laughs> We're, I mean, look, in a way, the problem is this. Pulling a rabbit out of a hat. We've got this normative rabbit, this rabbit of hotness. <laughs> being pulled out of a purely descriptive hat. Well, wait a minute. There must be something in that hat, or something about the way in which we're pulling out that's already rabbity, right? <laughs> Maybe the rabbit is in my sleeve. Maybe it's in a bottom part of the hat. But in any case, I'm not getting out of nothing. There's got to be something that it has a normative element to it, and therefore a moral element to it about phase two as well. And indeed, what is playing that role, that normative role for Hume? Feeling or emotion, but what about it is giving us anything normative? Yeah. It's not universal how I feel about something about the same as how someone else might feel about the same. Ooh, okay, good. Because <laughs> whatever it is, it's that plus or minus, the thumbs up or thumbs down aspect, right? I either have a good feeling about it or a bad feeling. But now he's raising an important problem. What if you have a good feeling about it and I have a bad feeling? Right? This happens all the time. Just think about almost any political figure. Think about Donald Trump. Okay? <laughs> Some people are going to think, yeah! Others are going to be, whoa! Okay, and so among some people, Donald Trump arouses a feeling of approval. Among others, a feeling of disapproval. And I don't mean to pick on Trump, it could be any political figure, right? And so what do we do about that? How do we respond? So one of the questions I'd like to ask you is, well really, it's me, I get to decide what's moral? And if I get to decide, you mean everybody else has to obey my feelings of approval and disapproval? Or is it rather that each obeys his own? So it's very, easy to get from this to relativism, where, hey, I approve, so it's good for me. You disapprove, so it's bad for you. And that means we're in a weird place where we can't even sharply disagree any longer, because all you mean is that it, it arouses a good feeling in you. I say, but all I mean is that it arouses a bad feeling in me. It's kind of like mushrooms. I love them. Some of you might hate them. Or calamari. <coughs> One time I was visiting another university, and they said, they took me out to dinner and said, hey, should we order some calamari? I said, I'd rather eat Robert Benton's. Uh, <laughs> in any event, yeah, I didn't get invited back. Uh, but you might think, look, that's part of the problem 
uh, you might react in a very different way from me, so what do we do about that? <coughs> Alright, are there other questions you'd like to get asked here? Yeah. Ooh, right, it's not just plus or minus. What if you don't feel anything at all? Here we've both got the problem of difference, right? Um, maybe you are approving, I'm disapproving, somebody else is just like, eh. Say, what do you think of Donald Trump? Eh, whatever, right? That's quite possible. Now, if everybody feels that way, we have to say, well, there is nothing moral that follows. Somebody says, my shirt is blue. And nobody really says, yeah, blue shirts, go blue. <laughs> and nobody really says, oh, I hate blue shirts. It's just kind of bad, right? <laughs> And so in that case, it's just not of any moral significance at all. So if we all agree about that, then it's okay. I mean, it just means it's of no real moral interest. But if we disagree, if a lot of us are just like, eh, and some of us are still like, oh, it's terrible, then, then we've got back into this relevance problem. Yes? Okay, good. The question is, what if feeling is only one way of getting there? What if there are other ways? For example, what about the law? I tell you, look, it's illegal. And you might think it's something about which you have no particular feelings. Let's say it's some feature of the tax code. And I say, so, you know, someone in this situation will count as a blah, 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 and this will count as such and such a deduction if and only if blah, 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 blah. And I say, how do you feel about that? You're probably going to say, eh. I don't even understand that. <laughs> I don't have any feeling about that. And then I say, oh, well, it's going to cost you $1,500. Then you say, ah, well, now I have to make a feeling about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that kind of thing, you might think, look, by itself, however I may feel about it, the law has something to do with what I ought to do. And actually, lots of things are like that, right? You're playing some game. You're playing killer bunnies with some friends. And there's a rule. And in the abstract, you don't have any feelings about the rule, but the rule tells you you have to do this. Well, then you do it, and it's not because you have any feeling of approval or disapproval, it's just that's the rules. UT says you have to take a signature course, so here you are, <laughs> right? And maybe you had a strong positive feeling, UT said signature courses, and you said, oh, I've got a feeling of approbation. <laughs> but more likely, you just thought, oh, I have to do it, okay, I'll do it. And it isn't something that really seems to fit this model very well at all. Well, anyway, all of those are good questions, and undoubtedly there are others you'd like to ask you. Even if reason won't get us there by itself, maybe rules, maybe laws, maybe, uh, I don't know, gosh, uh, the rules of the university, the rules of football, uh, maybe common social practices. You walk into a room, and there are a bunch of people you haven't met before, and they walk over and say, hi. And there are things you're supposed to do, right? <laughs> uh, and it may be that you don't really want to be there. It's not that doing these things will give you a great feeling of approval. There's no law that says you have to greet people and say hello, nice to meet you, or anything like that. Um, or, you know, if you're in Latin America, you're supposed to say mucho gusto, whether you feel mucho or gusto or not. <laughs> but, but hey, I mean, you know, that, it's... So anyway, there might be lots and lots of ways of getting from phase one to phase three. Now, here is Hume's final and really famous quotation, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. Okay, if in the end it is really the passions, feeling, emotion, that gets us to moral conclusions, and in particular practical conclusions about what we ought to do and ought not to do, then really reason has to follow the commands of the passions. And so he says reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions, because really, although reason might, in Plato's metaphor, be in the driver's seat, it can't do anything by itself. It is actually the horses of emotion and desire, feeling broadly construed, as he thinks of it, that actually moves us somewhere. And so, in a sense, the person in the chariot is really a slave of the horses, has to go where the horses ought to go. Now, Plato would say, wait a minute, <laughs> the person in the chariot had better issue commands and better control those horses. Hume thinks actually reasons just a lot to the rock can do no such thing. Yes? Oh yeah. <laughs> what did, her question is this. What do we call people who just act on the basis of their feelings without any involvement of reason? Her term is sociopath. <laughs> um, that is one way of thinking of it. You might think of other people who who act purely on the basis of emotion, impulsively, without much rational check. 
And that's not in general a good way to be. Right? So it's easy to react to you here by saying, wait, there's got to be something wrong. Surely reason shouldn't be the slave of the passions. And indeed, one of the most, one of the earliest and most, I think, compelling responses to you was by a writer whose name was Madame de Stel. Um, she wrote a lot of novels and led a lot of literary salons. She was a very influential figure. And she wrote an entire book as a response to you, basically saying no. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> passion unconstrained is hugely dangerous, and reason has to remain in control. Hume is right in the sense that one should live passionately, trying to abolish feeling, trying to abolish desire is not a good idea. But on the other hand, even though passionate living is important, it better be passions as guided by reason, not with reason acting as the slave of the passions. So I think your point is exactly right. And actually, she was the first person to say, not only do I think you're wrong, <laughs> I think this is going to lead to social disaster. <laughs> and then, in fact, predicted a lot of what was going to happen in the 19th and 20th centuries by just saying, you allow these passions to go unchecked, and man, we're in for a lot of trouble. And uh, she turned out to be right. <laughs> yes? Uh, where does experience fit in everything? Doesn't experience kind of, can't that kind of guide what you feel towards something? Ah, good. How does experience fit into the picture? He asks. And Hume thinks that's a great question. Because I think a lot of his response to these objections and worries is precisely experience. He would say, first of all, it is a treatise of human nature. We all share the same human nature. And so actually, we're going to largely feel approval and disapproval over the same things. Now, not exactly the same things, OK? There will be the cases of calamari and mushrooms with respect to food where we disagree. But on the other hand, food, good thing or bad thing? Everybody will think good, right? <laughs> How about the beautiful and the ugly? Do you like the beautiful better or the ugly better? All but a few emo people will say the beautiful. <laughs> uh, what about, oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, oh, I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves here. But in music, what is better? Something that's harmonious or just random cloudy? You might think the harmonious. Now, we are going to look later at futurists, and there are futurist artists who actually can produce works of great beauty. But then also futurist musicians who create machines that make bizarre voices. And so futurist music sounds kind of like bang, bang, ah. <laughs> Like, whoa, okay. Uh, it really didn't, even in 1915, when it was the new hot thing, command a very high position on the charts. Uh, but in any case, you can say, look, first of all, there's a lot of agreement about human nature. But secondly, experience tends to lead us in similar directions. And so we have experience of different things, true, and our experiences might differ one from another. But on the other hand, there's going to be a lot of similarity in experience because we're reacting to the same world. And so Hume would say, look, the divergence isn't nearly as large as you might think. Yes, there might be some moral issues on which people disagree based on different experiences, based on differences in their own natures. But the fact is, our human nature overlaps so extensively, and our experiences overlap so extensively, that these problems are relatively small. Most of the time, we're going to agree. We're certainly going to agree about the big things. And that's because our natures are very similar, and our experiences are really surprisingly similar as well. Well, the second idea that I want to talk about, that is a major factor of the Enlightenment, and shapes the problems of the 20th century, is the idea of a two-level theory. On a theory like this, there is a surface level, but also a deep level, a depth level. And the idea is that what happens hidden at that deep level determines what happens at the surface level. It is an abstract characterization here. The term two-level theory is my own. But the idea really is that we've got this level on the surface of what appears, the level of things as they seem to be around us, but then there's this hidden deep level that's actually controlling the behavior of the objects, including people, at the more advanced level, at the higher surface level. So we might depict it this way. There is this surface level, which is apparent to us, and the level to be explained. And then there is a hidden deep level that is explaining, according to the theory, that surface level. Can you think of examples of this kind of theory? Yeah. Excellent. Freudian psychology. Ego, superego, id. OK? What do you? think you're doing? Well, according to Freud, you don't know what you're thinking or what you're doing most of the time. It's this hidden struggle between the ego, the superego, and the id. 
and these unconscious forces are controlling you, your conscious mind and awareness has relatively little to do with it. And so in Freud, the surface level is your conscious thinking. The hidden deep level is the unconscious with all these faculties and hidden desires and so forth. And that's really determining what is happening at the higher level. Well, it's much more abstract than that. There are lots of different versions. And indeed, one of the main ones, and continually most influential, comes from the scientific revolution itself. The scientific revolution is something that started with the work of Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton, in, as you can see from, from well, roughly the beginning of the 16th up through uh, the, where we do, the 18th century. And what did these people do? By the way, you don't have to write down their names. I hope you already know who Galileo was and who Newton was. But I mean, no, I'm not going to say, midterm exam question, when was Isaac Newton born? Was it the same year or the year from Galileo's death? Um, I won't. Uh, here is the important thing. And again, don't worry about the details of this. But what did they do? What was the great accomplishment? It was to come up with a system of scientific laws. Scientific laws that were able to explain macro-level behavior. And so here is an example of some of those laws. You probably recognize them from high school physics. Um, the distance something falls is one half the gravitational constant times the time squared, Galileo's law. Or the sum of the forces on an object is zero. Uh, only if the acceleration of the object is zero. In other words, Newton's first law of motion, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. Force is mass times acceleration, another of Newton's laws. Um, the sum of the forces from A to B is just the inverse of the forces, the sum of the forces from B to A. And then the law of gravitation. The gravitational force between up two objects is the gravitational constant times the product of their masses divided by the radius, the distance between them squared. Well, again, it's not important for our purposes what those laws are. What does matter is that these kinds of general, entirely universal and necessary laws were discovered by people during this time. And there was a revolution in people's understanding of the world as a result. Things are universal here in the sense that these apply to all objects at all places at all times. They are necessary in the sense that, you know, it's not up to the planets whether they want to move according to these laws. It's not like Mars and Venus <laughs> get together and say, oh, well, what shall be the force of attraction between us? <laughs> Right? It's not like people, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and stuff. but the planets don't operate according to these laws, right? I mean, it's not a question of, hey, would you like to have dinner on Saturday night, etc. It's just determined by the laws. Now, it's significant that they are universal, and they're necessary, they apply to all situations at all times, and they're necessary, they describe what has to happen, what must happen. Well, science quickly got institutionalized. The British Royal Society, the French Royal Academy, observatories, scientific journals. And it led to what is known as the Age of Enlightenment. It's also often called the Age of Reason. The thought is we can know the nature and laws of nature, but also then increasingly the aspiration was we can do the same thing with human beings, with society, and we even with ethics and politics. Immanuel Kant said the slogan of enlightenment is sapere aude, uh, de dare to know. Okay, interesting that he puts it in Latin, even in an essay that is not written in Latin. Why? Latin was at the time still the language that was the universal language of science, and so anyone from any country could understand and communicate by communicating in Latin. Well, the problem is really how do we reconcile that with morality? Okay? The same thinkers tend to actually think there are basic, universal, and necessary moral laws as well as scientific laws. But how does the moral law fit into that scientific picture? Almost immediately, people began to recognize that was a problem. Voltaire, for example, said, look, we should be just skeptical of anything beyond science. And when people make claims about religion or about morality or about politics, be tolerant of their view, but recognize this is now the realm of belief the realm of opinion and not knowledge. So let people say what they want, but the fact is there's no way to know who's right. So he was something of a skeptic, but preached toleration. Other thinkers had different authority, different ideas. Locke and Kant tried to take this as a brief for liberty, toleration, respect for rights. But other people took it different. Denis Diderot edited the 28-volume French Encyclopedia. 
So he was a materialist. He said, this world is only a mass of molecules. I suppose I should continue the accent here. This world is only a mass of molecules. Anyway, that's all it is. Molecules floating around. Baron Dolbach said, yes, not only is it just a mass of molecules, but there is no God. It's just the molecules. There's nothing directing it. And even the people who tended to think, look, God must have created it, tended to be dates, thinking God created this mass of molecules and these laws, but then just let it play out, and so had no, no further interaction with the world. Well, there are some theses, though, that as a result of this, the Enlightenment figures share. And this is going to be the background against which we'll find many people in the 20th century rebelling. First of all, a thesis about truth. There are truths that are absolute, that are independent of any individual mind, and thus universal. The scientific laws are a great example. The laws of mathematics, another example. Okay, these are things that are universal, necessary, absolute, and independent of any individual mind. A second piece is knowledge. It is possible to have objective knowledge of some of them. And there's an excellent example. There can be a mathematical Newton's framework. A third reason. Reason. Reason is the best way to achieve and justify such knowledge. And here you see the first page of one of the key chapters in Newton's work, Axiomata Siwe Leges Motus. Okay? In other words, the axioms, or the laws of motion. And the very first one is what I mentioned earlier. Things at rest tend to stay at rest. Things in motion tend to stay in motion. Well, finally, progress. <laughs> Acting rationally in response to objective knowledge is the best way to achieve our ends. <laughs> there you see, uh, around 1900, a brand new technological marvel, marvel, the latest fire engine. As you can see, it's a car that has to be pulled by horses. And there is a 1900 bathing beauty beside it, smoking a cigar. <laughs> Okay, well, later on in the century, there are different theories, the theory of evolution, for example, but here is the bottom line. These views, materialism, evolutionary biology, a variety of other Enlightenment views, and as we'll see later embellishments on them, this 20th century slide, do imply that there are two levels. There is this surface conscious level of the world as it seems to us, and of ourselves as we see for ourselves, and then an underlying explanatory level. They change our concept of what it is to be human. Why? Because they imply that we ultimately aren't aware of the ultimate causes of our behavior. Why are you here? You might think, well, because, and then all sorts of things, because I care about knowledge, I was interested in this subject. I had to take some signature course, and I was the only one open, etc., etc., whatever it is, you would give that kind of answer. But according to the scientific revolution, there's another kind of answer available. Well, the molecules inside your body were reacting in a certain way. There were external stimuli. They prompted certain neural reactions. And this followed. <laughs> okay? And that, that explanation would be given ultimately in terms of pure physics. And we're not aware of that. So it implies that most of the time, we don't know what on earth we're 